Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Megan Raymond. I direct programs, events, and sponsorship here at WCET. And if this is your first WCET event, please visit our website to learn more about us. This webcast is being recorded and we'll share the link out and any resources that you may find helpful as you learn more about this grant or begin to apply. If you have any questions at all, please enter them into the Q&A and we'll be sure to get those at the Q&A section of the presentation. And if you put them into chat, we'll keep an eye on them, but sometimes we do lose track of the questions if you put them into the chat. So try and put them into the Q&A. The slides are available. I think Kim just put the link in there for you. And without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to Tanya Spillifoy, my colleague and OER expert here at WCET. And I do want to let you know that we updated the time and this presentation will take just about 30 minutes today. So you have a little extra time for lunch. So Tanya, take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We are just thrilled to talk about the Open Textbook Pilot at the Department of Education and our fantastic guest today, who is Josh Halpern. And Josh is a professor emeritus of, in the Department of Chemistry at Howard University. And he also has tons of time to devote to the development of LibreText and advocate for the project as the outreach team chair. So I'm so pleased to have him as our guest today to talk about his experience as a, as a Department of Education grantee. So I'd like to first just give a quick overview of the Department of Education's Open Textbook Pilot Grant. It's a very exciting grant. It's a US federal grant program and it supports projects at institutions of higher education and the primary cost savings and open textbooks and they're focused on um, achieving savings for students. And this first started in 2018 and with a lot of advocacy, um, there is a total of $35 million that's been appropriated for open textbook programs that benefit students across the country. So this year was a very exciting year. Um, the fiscal year 2022 funding package, it included $11 million for the open textbook pilot program. And that's actually a $4 million increase over the previous expenditure. So it's, it's a quick timeline for anybody who's interested in applying. Uh, the Open Textbook Pilot Program was opened May 26, so just about a month ago. And you have to have your applications due to the Department of Education, all secure in G5 by July 25, 2022. Um, the grant competition will award about $2.6 million in federal funds, and they're looking to expand um, or create the use of open textbooks. So just as a quick overview, uh, you can find the application on the Department of Education's main page, but also you can see that there's absolute priorities in this federal application that are very important to pay attention to. Um, improving collaboration and dissemination, addressing gaps in the open textbook marketplace and bringing those solutions to scale promoting student success. And then there's also competitive priorities that make you just a little bit more competitive in the, in the grant application, uh, using technology-based strategies for personalized learning and continuous improvement, and you get points for that. And there's also an invitation priority uh, for especially for minority serving institutions and community colleges. So these are things to pay attention to in your applications and to really watch for as that grant moves forward. So now I'd like to invite Josh to talk about his experience as the very first grantee. Um, LibreText won the complete prize package during the first uh, open education pilot grant program. And we're so proud of LibreText and we, I'm sure everyone would love to hear about your experience, how you did it, um, advice for the crowd. So take it away, Josh. Thanks very much. And thanks for this invitation. Um, we had a frantic month. I, it was the month of August. There were, there were, our consortium was eight schools with multiple 
players in each school and we had nine other uh, people at other institutions and we we made it all come together and i think we've made good use of the money but i'd like to start out with my view of oer there are really four players there's the there's the faculty and what you have to understand is the faculty are in it and they specify textbooks based on what the textbooks do for their instruction. And they're the students, of course. And until now, student, students are the next one. Students, of course, really have been suffering under the high cost of textbooks. But from our point of view, the important thing besides the cost is they haven't been getting the textbooks that they really could make use of. Textbooks can really be improved by uh, technical technical applications. And of course, then there's the dean, and he's the next guy. You recognize him, he's from Townsville. And we have the publishers. Next one. And the publishers are, let's face it, in for the money. But to get the money, what the, and this is the key observation we've made, the publishers market to the faculty. They don't market to the students, it's like drugs. But recently, in the last four or five years, the students have found ways around this, and that has caused the publishers to take other actions, such as inclusive access and also marketing homework systems. And our job, next one, is to take the place of the publishers. So let's go to the next slide. The way most people, most faculty, most students think of OER is this is a replacement for a textbook. And in fact, it can be much, much more than that. And just having the library model for uh, OER leads you to a lot of problems. There's high operating costs, link rot, and you're still stuck with this pretty much static textbook. So Libertex has this model, which we had in 2018, which is what an important part of the proposal, so next slide. That really the libraries have to be surrounded by a lot of services. And if we can go to the next slide after this, I think. You can do, oh, oh back one. You can do a lot of really creative things. Uh, you can incorporate annotation. Uh, Jesslyn Bird at St. Mary's actually built annotated textbooks using the annotation and Libertex and has now published these as Libertex. That's one nice example. We now have a homework system. It's moving slowly out of beta and should be fully available. And that's direct competition for the commercial publishers. We include computation. We operate very differently from the other OER projects in that we have a single uniform format and online and this allows us to take care of a lot of things using a, an array of bots. And we're provide, going to be providing, we're going to be rolling out our learning analytics, which will let people who are using our homework system see what their students are doing with the homework system. And finally, we can communicate uh, over the common cartridge to your learning management system. And the idea is to form a perfect circle to have faculty working with the libraries, the libraries support their students and the students and the faculty support each other. Next slide, please. So what have we built? And I would say about two thirds of this has been built since 2018, maybe more. We have over 1200 books. These are books that are in our libraries that are curated by Libertex. We have right now a thousand, I counted last night. It's a thousand and one uh, custom Libertex. These are mostly remixes uh, from 275 institutions uh, and it's worldwide. And we've had over 800 million site visits. You can see the accumulated impact there. And the reason, part of the reason we support such large libraries is we have over 4,500, 450,000 uh, pages of content which you can use to build your own book. Go to the next slide. You can see where our books are and where our site visits are. About 30% of our site visits come from South Asia, principally India. 
uh, there's not a country where we don't have students using our site. And part of the thing that helps this is we started out as a chemistry OER site called ChemWiki. And we're, we were very well established in the chemistry space in 2018 when we made the proposal. So we, we could say, this is what we've done in chemistry. You can't do a search in chemistry, anything having to do with chemistry on the web uh, without Libertex coming up on the first page. The other thing is chemistry is very, I'd say unique in terms of STEM and maybe uh, everything else in that it has a very strong chemistry education focus. Uh, not so much in the R1s, but certainly uh, R2s and so forth. And even in the R1s, you can find places uh, like Michigan State, which have uh, chemistry, chemistry education divisions in their department, uh, certainly in the R2s. And there's always been an emphasis on finding new ways of teaching chemistry, because as every MD will tell you, chemistry is hard. And we know that. So if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> this was our proposal, <clears throat> our proposal team. We had two California community college districts and a Maryland community college, one woman's college, two R1s, two PUIs, two M minority serving institutions, and the California State University Chancellor's Office was involved. We also had collaborators who were working with us uh, at other institutions. They brought things with them. Uh, for example, Mike Gage at Rochester, who was the one who built uh, web, web work, was part of the proposal. We had three community colleges there, two R1s, two PUIs. These were uh, individuals at the institutions who were uh, funded through the grant. And we divided ourselves up into four teams, which I think really helped the proposal. This was remarked on in the uh, reviews. We had a construction and harvesting team. We have to bring things in and put it into our format and also uh, do some editing on anything in the Libertex corpus. We have an assessment and an analysis team, which uh, has really become vitally important in the last two years since the plague hit. Outreach and dissemination, we included that in the proposal. Uh, and we said specifically, it does you no good to build a better mousetrap if you don't have any mice. And we have a technology to go to the next slide. So uh, I don't, for those who don't know, grep is a Unix command, which means compare these two files. So I went last night and I compared the 2018 proposal that we uh, proposed under and the 2022 call. We read the 2018 call as if it was the Bible and it was the Bible. And every point that was there, even if it was a word, we tried to answer, we tried to provide a, an answer to. The things that struck out to me from the 2022 call is the proposal must come from the consortium. That was certainly open, uh, I think, certainly in 2019. And it has to be three or more institutions. They specifically say you can include trade or professional organizations and workforce stakeholders. I think it would be really cool to include some unions that were running uh, uh, training programs. And they strongly suggest, but next year you go, it's going to have to include MSIs and or community colleges. It's not clear if you have to include both, but a word to the wise, I think would be include them if you can, if you can find the right partners. And finding the right partners, uh, if you have an hour or so sometime, I'll tell you how to find the right, right partners. Part of the reasons we have the right partners is Delmar Larson was already working with community colleges in California. And I was working with uh, the uh, Prince George's Community College in Maryland and had actually had NS, two NSF grants with them and a NASA grant, which supported 
in part reforming their engineering education. So you find your partners and you cherish them. Another thing that stuck out to me is they said in two places that any new materials have to meet open standard pro protocols and be interoperable. Frankly, I don't know what this means. And this is something I would certainly ask the Department of Education about. Uh, you can make a lot of arguments around this, but it's something that has to be answered in the proposal. And you must specify the standards that you're going to use, which is even trickier. Technology is a really important area uh, one of the things that stuck out to me is they specifically said in this call that any technology must support faculty and staff delivering the course. And then the other thing which was a little strange is it must allow students to tailor their own learning or provide monitoring by faculty. There's a lot of room for mischief there. They must, accessibility is a must driven by universal de design and they say it must be open and free. And the only thing they say specifically that you only can ask to be acknowledged for creating the material. This to me, again, a place I would really, really, really talk to Department of Education on is, does this mean you can't have NC materials under Creative Commons? Does this mean you can't have ND materials? Okay, I think there's one more is there? Next slide. Yeah, questions from the audience. Well, is anybody going to volunteer? I I have I have a, a question for you. Um, sure. My first my first one is, uh, what is your main advice for? Uh, anyone who's looking to do an application? So the, I mean, you said that you're month of August was frantic and um, it the the deadline is really looming ahead and they only had a short window in the first place so um, what's your first and main where would you start if you were going to I would start by reading I would start by reading the call for proposal and I'd read it uh, with other people who are going to be in my consortium uh, that's the first place the second thing is kind of general, I, I had pretty good success over the years uh, getting grants. And the thing to realize about grants is it takes you just as much time to do all the other stuff as the, pro, as the project summary. So get, but you can, do the pro, you can do all the biographies and the letters and everything as just as soon as you can. Get that put away so you're not looking at the last moment for a letter uh, from some uh, chancellor of one of your consortium members, because you're gonna need that. You gotta start that right away, you, because you gotta, you gotta get that through the dean, through the associate provost, through the provost. And it's, it helps to get it from the provost, but the president or the chancellor, that's the real person. So get all that stuff done uh, and have, you have a consortium, one person can't write, one person can write the abstract, but they can't write a lot of the other stuff. Uh, for example, in the, pro, in the, in the um, project uh, summary, you have the budgets. The budgets basically lay out the role of every person in the consortium. And I mean down to every person. Every person who was going to do something that we knew at the time on the all the team members, we said, if you're getting support, we have to describe this in the budget statement. Let's do that. And we did that pretty early. Yeah, at the end, you have to jiggle around some numbers. Uh, a thing that may come up if you have a STEM research centered institution is this does not carry the 50% overhead. Mm -hmm. The Department of Education has an 8% overhead. You're going to need to get a waiver. And 
that can be not fun. So what, what I'm saying is, yes, you need, you need the, the write-up about why what you're going to do is going to have a major effect on education in the United States. But you also have a lot of mechanical things to do, which will occupy your time if you don't do it first. You don't, the, the writing team for the project summary doesn't have to be the team that's putting together all of the uh, bio sketches and everything else and put them all in uniform format. I hate to tell you how many proposals I've read for consortia where all the bio sketches were all over the place. Uh, it doesn't send the message you want to send. For example, if you've got somebody on your team who's really, really a Nobel Prize winner, uh, and you get a Nobel Prize uh, bio sketch, uh, it doesn't answer the question, what has this person done for education? So you want to reformat people's bio sketches so they meet the needs for the Department of Education. We went to people who had proposed to the Department of Education and talked to them a little bit about this, about what Department of Education uh, reviewers look for. And to the extent we were able to, we tried to reformat our bio sketches in that way. That's all really great advice. Um, I think that one of the things to also remind folks of is that not everybody who reviews your, um, your proposal knows what open is or what OER is. They don't necessarily have a technology background. And so explaining exactly what you're doing is really helpful, uh, not using acronyms, not just throwing out the names of a vendor platform or a technology, because um, the people who are reading it may not know what that is. And to you, it's really important and meaningful. And to them, it has no meaning. So um, explaining what you mean is really important. Uh, Esther had a great question. Um, when she asked, can you elaborate on the technical standards? And I'm guessing this is just in general asking about what interoperable means and um, sort of you were grappling with that a bit, Josh. Can you go into that? The short answer is I don't know. The long answer is here there be tigers. Um, and I suspect this is going to make a major difference but I also know that you can ask, has the Department of Education set up a, um, a, a, a fact where you can ask questions like that? I know that they set up um, webinars for the reviewers, but I'm not sure if they do for, I'm sure that they do also set up webinars for the applicants. Just kind of an information session. I, I'm, I, I'm sure I, I don't have it right in front of me now, but I, in previous times, uh, they had a, a, an email address where you could send questions. And that's certainly one question I would ask. And I would ask for examples and right. counter examples. I'll see if I can find that while you are um, answering more questions. And are there any other Folks that have questions on the call, we have just about seven minutes left. And this is a great time to talk to an actual grantee who's been through the process who can help you. Esther had another question. Her question is, is LibreTax willing to be a partner for future applicants? Um, I'm not, well, th this is interesting because uh, I went through the list of winners and I saw that uh, Pressbooks was partner in OpenStax on one of them, and there were some others. Uh, we're certainly willing. Uh, we are. We have had discussions about this, and our answer is: we are more than willing. We we need to be. If if we provide support, we need to be written into the grant in such a way that the grant will support the work that we are asked to do. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I sound like one. 
uh, in other words, we're, we're willing to provide letters. We're willing to provide uh, some help if we can in writing, but we don't want to be ghosty. So I think this is a great time for me to ask one of the questions that I had queued up for you, Josh, and that was, what distinguishes LibreTex from other platforms in the space? Uh, one word, we are faculty-centered. We are a creation of faculty that is operated by faculty. And we are very, uh, what's the word? Uh, we're very centered on the, the content. Uh, and we, we're driven by that. We have some technical differences. One is that we have an absolute uniform standard and a single repository, which is curated by the LibreTex project. We are a 501, we are a, a public benefit corporation now. That was a big change that was made in 2019. It wasn't quite clear what we were, but we were operating out of the University of California and out of the other, uh, the, the other member, the other institutional members, uh, but in order to set up a network that wasn't dominated by a single institution, we incorporated as a public benefit corporation, which also provides us, if we can't sell out to somebody. You can't sell a public benefit corporation to anybody. Uh, we're stuck. We're stuck with this. Uh, Anyhow, uh, those why I think the the principal differences. I could go on and say we're better. <laughs> and, and Fantastic. We we we, we are. Uh, look, um, we're very oriented towards. While we have books that are created specifically for LibreTex, we're very oriented to providing the tools that you need to remix, edit, and customize your book for your course. Thank you. And I provided in the chat um, the contact people that you can ask questions to at the Department of Education, Kieran Adams and Stacy Slipjebeck. Also, the the main application page on the Department of Education, so you can take a look at it. Um, we'd be happy to, uh, we'll send out a recording of this as well, so you can review it. And thank you so much to Josh for being here today. We've appreciated you. you sharing your expertise and your extra tips uh, for everybody who's interested in applying. Thank you so much. Great, and thank you, Tanya. And I'll just wrap up quickly and say we have lots of other great webcast recordings available on our website if you're interested in learning more. And save the date for our annual meeting, which will have wonderful OER content. We'll be face-to-face -face in Denver in the, in the fall, and the program is online as we speak. And then I just want to quickly acknowledge our sponsors and our supporting members that underwrite our events here at WCET. So thank you all, and good luck with your applications. Take care.